In 1997, East Asian economies severely hit by the Asian financial crisis. Through heartbreaking experiences and extremely hard work, these economies survived, learned lessons, and increased resilience individually and as a whole. Today, they thrive as a global engine for growth. But amid the world's current complex realities, how could Asia reflect on the growing pains, prevent itself from being dragged into another crisis and be a resilient beacon in a sea of change? Join us on this special series, Asian Financial Crisis 25 Years On, as we learn from key witnesses, pragmatic thinkers, and crucial stakeholders. Only on CGTN. Welcome back. This is World Insight with me, Tian Wei. The year 1997 was a rude awakening for many vibrant economies in East Asia. The financial trouble started with Thailand floating the bat against the dollar, coupled with economic overheating and vulnerabilities due to heavy reliance on exports, hurt many of the then budding economies of East Asia. 25 years after the Asian financial crisis, we are presenting to you this special production, Growing Pains to Building Resilience, Asian Financial Crisis 25 Years On, through exclusive interviews and crucial global discussions. Today, our talk with Lo Jiwei, former finance minister of China. As a savvy decision maker and eyewitness, he reflects upon some of the most dramatic moments amid the Asian financial crisis and how China managed to handle some of the most crucial decisions then and what China can learn now. Take a look. Minister Lo, what a pleasure. Thank you so much for taking your time. Now, 25 years ago, Asian financial crisis, China did manage to showcase its strengths and its uh, determination. But among all the policies China took, what do you consider most significant even today? Since the beginning of the crisis in Thailand, Asian finance has led to a domino effect. Every country has similar structural vulnerabilities, and they all fell down together. But that's not the case in China. In 1993, we faced inflation. So in 1994, we, most importantly, started to tighten monetary policies. So in 1996, we had a soft landing, unlike the countries hit by the crisis, which suffered economic overheating. The important reform we did, among others, is the foreign exchange reform, and we achieved renminbi capital account convertibility. We didn't open the capital account like other countries. At the time, we were managing exchange rates. These were not to be overestimated, and even sometimes these were underestimated. So the effects didn't affect us directly. But when they had a crisis, the effects spread from Southeast Asia to Northeast Asia. Our external demand for China's exports weakened immediately, which led to huge pressure for the RMB to depreciate. But we announced that we would not devaluate the RMB. Many people came to the Ministry of Finance saying if China depreciated the RMB, we'd all understand. But we insisted on not depreciating the currency. But were you nervous when that decision was made? We adopted an expansionary fiscal policy, so internal demand was expanded. At the time, China lacked sufficient infrastructure, so it was the right policy. It was also an efficient way to expand internal demand. That was very important to us. I think that up to now, we have made great efforts to carry out reforms since 1994. Just now, we only talked about the reform of foreign exchange and foreign trade. Up to now, these all have long-lasting effects. But over the years, we have opened our door to foreign investments more than needed from time to time. So now we need to further moderate it. We cannot allow hot money carelessly flowing in and out of China. The impact of rapid cross-border flow of money is not sustainable. So far, we have managed well overall. 
Now, the challenges we are facing are somewhat similar to those faced by Southeast Asian economies 25 years ago. One is that the leverage ratio was too high. After the central government announced to reduce the leverage in 2015, it fell. There was a platform period until 2019, but with the impact of the pandemic, the leverage is now more than 270. The U.S. dollar, we have seen the Fed's action recently. Uh, some say it's resembled what happened more than 25 years ago when the U.S. Federal Reserve was doing similar things. What do you consider? Do you see that is also one of the danger China is facing right now? How do you look at their actions? The monetary policy of the United States started to tighten, but it is too late for them to raise interest rates. The impact of high inflation on various countries is different. In Japan, the Japanese yen had dropped by 20 percent, but now it has returned to 15 percent. The euro has also dropped a lot, and Europe had to raise interest rates. In this way, we are in the opposite cycle from them. In 2020, we were hit, and soon we recovered. They are falling so much. When they are recovering, they need to raise interest rates, and they need to tighten fiscal policy and deal with inflation. We are now trying to recover the economy. We are in the opposite cycle from them. The impact on us is not so great. You can see that the exchange rate of the RMB has dropped by several percentage points, or 7 to 8 percent, compared with that of the U.S. and other countries. Also, as I said just now, interest rates in Europe didn't drop much compared to that of Japan. We have such a large economy, so the impact on us is not great, but the impact on some vulnerable countries is huge, such as Sri Lanka. So the most important problem is their own weaknesses. When a country does not have many vulnerabilities, the impact will not be so great. A lot of ballots focus on security and development. So how do you see you know, China's pace of continuing to reform and opening up, which is very important, uh, and also the issue of so-called security. I will focus on one aspect, the finance sector, to use as an example. China joined the WTO in 2001. According to WTO rules, there was a five-year transition period. By 2006, we have honored all our commitments to financial openness, so China accomplished that within the five-year period. After that, when we proceeded to continue to develop the finance sector, the Asian financial crisis broke out. That made China become cautious, which is natural, right? Because of the crisis, our financial development became less open. In other words, not open enough. Then at the Boal Forum for Asia in 2018, Chinese President Xi Jinping announced four major opening up measures, one of which is to focus on really opening up the financial sector. Are we doing it? I can say that now there is no difference between foreign financial institutions and domestic financial institutions in China. They are treated exactly the same. There is no restriction on the how much percentage of shares foreign institutions can hold, and there is no restriction on their scope of operation. There is no restriction. When I was conducting field research at the CPPCC, some foreign financial institutions told me they encountered such and such problems. I told them, yes, you are absolutely right in reporting these issues. I will go to the regulatory authorities and communicate your problems. But let me tell you something. You are being treated like our citizens. There is no discrimination against foreign institutions. Chinese domestic financial institutions also encountered the same problems. We will solve them gradually. So I would say the balance between openness and security has been assessed. China has such a big market. We are not afraid to open up. We recognize that our financial market has so many weaknesses, and we appreciate the financial institutions in advanced countries, and we welcome their mechanics and their ways of operation to come into China. It will help China's financial market to mature. Opening up is consistent with our development direction. You see, we are regulating our financial market. We are trying to reduce leverage. 
So it's all consistent. You know, China is different, right, compared to 25 years ago. Do, do you see the danger that others might use this as a tool uh, in geopolitical rivalry? China did not suffer so hugely from the Asian financial crisis 25 years ago because we were able to implement counter-cyclical fiscal responses. Today, the challenges we face have become political and even ideological, right? I remember back in the day during the one U.S.-China strategic economic dialogue, one key issue the U.S. brought up was about China's industrial subsidies. At the time, we admitted that we had these problems and we were correcting them. Now the situation has been reversed. The United States has just adopted the $280 billion CHIPS and Science Act. The law specifically says it is to counter China and prevents companies to build facilities in China if they want to receive government funding. So the subsidies have been politicized, right? China has never made any laws like that. Once the U.S. does that, then they take away the basis for dialogue between China and the U.S. The U.S. CHIP Act was saying that U.S. companies could only get shares of the $280 billion with the condition that we would not work with China. What kind of act is this? So what is China going to do? But we, China, will have to continue to adhere to our own principles and practices, stick to opening up, continue to uphold multilateralism. In fact, American companies do not like the U.S. government's approach. Okay, let's just say the U.S. government could give a company $1 billion in funding. But the Chinese market is a $10 billion opportunity for that company. So is that a good deal for the company to take 10 and forgo 100? The U.S. has also prided itself as a market economy. Does it act like one now? <laughs> That's a very important question. Thank you so much, Minister Lowe.